with us today are our visiting scholars are Judge Lisa Mance, sitting here first. Judge Mance graduated from Dickinson College with a BA in History in 1990 and received her JD from Emory in 1993. So yay, Emory alum. Uh, judge Mance has served as the Associate Judge in the Newton County Juvenile Court since 2002. Previously, she served as a Special Assistant Attorney General for Newton County, Putnam County, and Jasper County. She is working closely with the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Committee on Justice for Children, to provide assistance in areas related to deprivation, the Indian Child Welfare Act, our topic for today, and other foster care issues. Judge Mance is also an active member in her community. She serves on the State Board of Education Truancy Task Force, the State Infrastructure Grant, as a member of KidsNet Academy Planning Committee, and is currently an advisory board member for the Strategic Prevention Framework State Incentive Grant. She's currently a member of the Child and Adolescent Strategic Team and the chairperson of the Newton County Truancy Protocol Committee. She's a speaker and presenter at child welfare and continuing education conferences for attorneys and the judiciary and community stakeholders, including the Child Support Enforcement Conference, the Georgia Council of Juvenile Court Judges Conferences, Superior Court Guardian at Litem Training, foster care parent training, the Department of Juvenile Justice Conferences, and others. Her interests include the effect of nutrition and well-being on academic achievement, and juvenile delinquency and antisocial behavior and juvenile competency. As you can see, she's very busy. So we're lucky to have her, and we're lucky to have her presenting to you all as an audience um, and add to the list of all of her presentations. With her today is Chief Neely McCormick, who started out his career in law enforcement in 1978 as a patrolman in Whitesburg, Georgia. In 1985, he became the Chief of Police in Pelham. Uh, Chief Neely is also the Chairman of the Georgia Council on American Indian Concerns. He has served under the last four governors. The Georgia Council on American Indian Concerns works to preserve the cultural legacy of Georgia Indians, to protect their burial and archaeological sites, and to enhance their lives and well-being in the present. In 1992, the Council was created by the General Assembly to help protect Indian burial sites and to facilitate the return or repatriation of Indian human remains and burial objects from any Georgia museums whose collections are not subject to federal law. In 2002, the Council was authorized to assume duties of the Office of Indian Heritage from the Secretary of State in three additional areas relating to Georgia's American Indians, economic development, cultural heritage, and consultation with federal, state, and local governments. Chief Neely is married to his wife, Marion McCormick, and has two children, David and Ashley. So I hope that you'll agree that we couldn't have found two better presenters for today's topic on the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, I think you'll learn a lot from them. I encourage you to think of your questions and comments and to have an open exchange with our presenters. And I hope you'll join me in welcome welcoming today's visiting scholars in practice. Okay, I'm on now, right? All right, so I guess there's a few details that weren't in the introduction that we should probably clear up. So um, not only is Chief McCormick um, married to Bonnie McCormick, which is her name that she goes by, um, she is also the chief of the Creek tribe. So um, it took a little while to get their title straight because apparently everybody in the household is a chief. So. <laughs> If you, if you feel the need to call there, make sure that you know exactly which, which chief you're looking for because uh, the children will ask. Some are more chiefs than the others. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, uh, I guess have an interest in um, Indians that, that started very young because I grew up in northeast Pennsylvania where all the towns um, have Indian names, but there weren't any Indians. And I asked all the time why and what. So. It, it's kind of fitting that I'm here today, but I will tell you that I recently went home, and I'm from Carbon County, Pennsylvania, so there's two things that Carbon County is known for. One, it's the handprint in the jail where the Molly McGuire said, I'm innocent, and his handprint is still there. And the other is that the town is, was changed, uh, changed their name in the early 50s from Machunk to Jim Thorpe because the greatest athlete in the world is now buried at the end of our town. And so the only reason, and the only way my husband would come home with me was so he could go see the memorial to Jim Thorpe. So with those two things there, we'll, we'll step on to the Indian Welfare Act. And we're going to try and do this in a, in a very back and forth fashion, um, assuming that you're going to have a lot more questions for this chief than for me. So uh, if we start with why, um, and of course, 
ICWA stands for the Indian Child Welfare Act. It was passed in 1978, and it was, it was passed because there were an alarming number of children that were being removed um, from their homes and placed with private agencies. And the act is, is actually a very, it's not a large act when it comes to the size of federal acts, but it, it, it states very clearly um, in the provisions the whys of why it was done. So we'll kind of go through this clear, quickly because I know you can all read. So it was to promote the best interests of Indian children and promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and their families. And those, um, the requirements apply to state custody proceedings that involve Indian children who are um, either members or eligible for members in a federally recognized tribe. So the purpose is to provide, to protect Indian children, to preserve and strengthen Indian families, to ensure permanency for Indians, children, to protect the continuing existence of Indian cultures, and to ensure that tribes can exercise their sovereign authority over child proceedings. The, you got it? No, you got to go back. Back there. Okay. So go back one more. Go to, no, no, go, away. go, 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 go. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so there we are. That, that's the why. The 1976 study of the Association of American Indian Affairs found that 25 to 35 of all Indians were, were being placed in out-of-home placement, and 85% of them were being placed in non-Indian homes or institutions. So, okay. Okay, I think we're going... I don't know what's happening with our slides. We seem They're to be out of place. We're out of place. Okay, just kind of keep going. Go that way. Okay. All right, we're just going to take a two second time out to figure out how we managed to get our slides out of order. But, all right, so, so but we can stop at that slide because that is really the, really the, the whole crux of, of the act is to make sure, and as social workers and people in the child welfare system, we could understand this, is that we want to make sure that the relationships and the cultures are all promoted from within the Indian tribe. So, and that just seems common sense. So the act is, is pretty much straightforward on its face. It's if you have a child that meets the criteria of being a Native American child, then they are afforded higher protections, and you're going to assume that they, their cultures are protected. So Also, to, to protect the interests of the tribes themselves, uh, right. because um, losing, they, they were losing at such a rate, it was actually endangering the, the tribal communities themselves. Okay. So if you involve the tribal welfare uh, workers and attorneys, then obviously you're going to get the assistance that you need in trying to find help for the family. You'll have the ability to have assistance from them. You'll work in a joint effort. You'll have tribal intervention, possible transfer of the case, but also the sharing of critical information, and they will make a maximum input on, on decisions. So. Um, the Indian Child Welfare Act does not, um, it works in conjunction with the um, Adoption and Safe Families Act because when that was passed, it didn't make any exclusion. So those two acts work together. And if we can get to that slide, okay, if, if we can get to that slide, okay, which okay. Okay. this one, because that's what we're going to talk about. So, so if you can, okay, we'll just get it back here. See the next one. There we go. Okay. All right, Chief. All right. This is what this is talking about is the um, the history. The um, there was a policy of assimilation. Um, some of it started right after the Compact of 1802. But uh, what the government wanted to do, they thought it was wise to assimilate these tribes, basically disband them, and assimilate them into the dominant culture. And um, what they were doing, this policy went on up until fairly recently. Uh, they, they had force, uh, the, they would take the children away from the tribes and send them to boarding schools where they would teach them, would not let them speak their language, actually punish them if they did, and try to take as much Indian out of them as they possibly could. And, uh, and that forced assimilation has really created a lot of resentment sometimes. So, and it's still pretty strong, and, and uh, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people um, that about really no older than I am that, that was part of that, uh, that process. All right, 
So if we go to the, the next one, should be the next one. There you go. Okay. And we're kind of out of place here, so we're trying to figure out where we're at. All right. So All right. On, on the uh, core values, now, um, there's a lot of difference in culture between the tribes. There's, um, sometimes there's as much difference as maybe like the, the Swedish people are, maybe from the um, Hungarians or something. It's just that there's a lot of, there is differences between them. But there are some, some core. They, they tend to be more spiritual. Um, uh, they tend to um, uh, have extended families, and particularly with the Muscogee people. Um, everybody has got a responsibility for that tri for that uh, child. Uh, they're encouraged to go out and stay with the grandparents or uncles, um, even just other members of the tribe seem to have or, or take on some of the responsibility for raising that child. And you know they may refer to, to other people's or uncles or aunts. It's not really uncles or aunts, but they, it's, it's more of a, a group type uh, raising. There is a, a closeness to uh, nature that, that is with, for those people that are raised within the Indian communities uh, than you might see otherwise. I mean, they, they tend to respect the nature uh, and you know the uh, animals and, and the other thing, kind of oneness with, with that that seems to follow it. Uh, there's a great difference in, in the religious um, outlook of uh, the Muscogee people, I can speak, they, they, were, they believed in one God, um, and, um, and that kind of translated later on when most became Christians. There's still some practice in the old religion. Um, so th there's differences along that way. I think one of the, oh, one, yeah. of, one of the ones that might, for the, us of the, I guess we'll call ourselves the dominant culture, but uh, relativity of time, Chief, how would you comment on how things work? Yeah, well, you usually, uh, they really don't look at time the same way. I mean, they, they speak a lot about Indian time. Uh, I kind of got mine messed up this morning because I got up here really early. But uh, they, they kind of pace with nature. Um, and they may actually... Uh, uh, get up early, you know, during the, the summer months and, you know, sleep late during the winter. I mean, they don't really look at it um, in the same way that time drives everything. They just, they, they just move along with nature. So sometimes there's frustration with Indian people because they may be late or, <laughs> but it's just, it's just part of the culture. Okay. All right. So, how do you access the Indian Child Welfare Act? Well, first you have to look at who an Indian child is. So that's clearly defined in the statute, but just because it's clearly defined in the statute doesn't mean it's easily put into practice sometimes. So we'll talk about maybe that when we get a little further. So an Indian child is a child that's unmarried, under the age of 18, and either a member of a federally recognized tribe or is the child of a biological parent who is eligible for membership in the tribe. So either they're already in or they could be uh, if the parent could take the steps to have them be enrolled in the tribe. And tribal, do you want to go to the next one? Enrolling in the tribe, uh, there's a couple of ways to look at, we just said, they can actually um, become enrolled uh, during the proceedings. And if they become enrolled during the proceedings, then they were not a, they were not a, a child who was subject to the protections before, but they would then, going forward, you'd have to apply the, the standards for the act. I need to come enrolled. I need to explain if the parent is an Indian, they are the member of a tribe, right? All right, hold on one second because we're going to use the mic so you can. I was asking to for a little further explanation of that because if the parent is an Indian, they are the member of a tribe, right? And so their child wouldn't automatically be the member of the same tribe? All right, I'm going to let the chief handle that one. Not necessarily. Like the Seminoles require uh, the child to be registered, just automatically become a member. At least that was their practice in the past. Uh, some child are automatically registered into the tribe when they're born. Each tribe is different, and each tribe has set its own requirements for, the, for membership. Some are based on Indian blood degree, and that Indian blood degree may not be 
necessarily uh, the racial makeup. It could be based on a uh, base role, uh, the, 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 the original role for that tribe. Uh, for ours particular, it's 1832 role. But it, it, it would come off of that, for, you know, and they'd have a, a limit, maybe a quarter, maybe a half, would be the cutoff. So every tribe's different. And, and still keep in mind, too, that that person may be eligible for membership in more than one tribe. And it may depend, his grandparents may have been a member of a different tribe, and they might be eligible for that. So it's different for each tribe. And the tribe's got the final say in it. Okay. I've got a question over there. We've got two questions. Chris, Mr. Church. Where do we access the list of the federally recognized tribes? Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has the list. And I think it's also published in a number of other register. The Federal Register. But I think also the National Indian Child Welfare Association um, puts it up. Um, at the end of the PowerPoint, y'all got PowerPoints. I think we listed the, a number of the resources, and they are, they are definitely in there. I mean, that the. Um, we have another question here. Yeah. Can you tell us why some okay. tribes are federally recognized and okay. some aren't? Okay, can you let, let's wait for the question is explain why some of the tribes are federally recognized and tribes aren't. This is why the chairman is here. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of it's by accident of history. Um, some of these tribes were colonial tribes uh, that were, um, had relations with the colonies at that time before the United States was ever formed. Uh, they may have had a treaty with that state or that colony before it was a state, uh, may even had land set aside. By the time the United States came about, there was no military reason to make a treaty with that tribe. So they never received any, any recognition or no, there's no treaty relationship there. They had a government to government relationship between the United States and them. Uh, some of the tribes are remnant tribes. Uh, during the removal period, there was portions left uh, there. And some of those tribes have already, have later became federally recognized or in the process and that's a, that's part of the barment process, and it's a whole lesson in itself. Um, but that's one of the reasons why they're, they're unrecognized, um, it, mostly by acts of history. Some tribes were recognized previously and were terminated under the termination uh, policy, which is a real cruel policy that came about uh, in the 1950s and actually was ended by Richard Nixon uh, in, in the 70s. And uh, that policy was to, uh, to terminate the, the tribe and, uh, and uh, allow them to just completely assimilate into the dominant society. And so you have, you have a federally recognized tribe on a reservation one day, and the next day the part of the poorest county in the, you know, in the United States. So that's how a lot of that went. You stated that a child can be eligible for more than one tribe. Can that child therefore be a member of more than one or do they have to choose only one tribe to apply for and find out the status of that? Like everything else in Indian law, it depends. <laughs> That's just like dominant law, it depends. Yeah. Um, that um, not all of those Indian children be, it would be eligible for other membership of the tribe. Just in some cases it would be that way. You may have intermarriage uh, between two different tribes. There could be you know, different reasons why they might be eligible for membership in more than one tribe. Uh, most tribes have, have prohibited a membership in more than one tribe. Either you have to be a member of, say, ours or members of theirs. They have to choose. Some do not require that, but most do. Okay, there we go. I think somebody asked the question, but there's, there's, the, there's the slide that says that um, it's the tribes who determine the membership. So, and each tribe has different requirements, and so if you're trying to figure out if it applies to that tribe, then you need to contact that tribe directly. 
One other point on that, though, you cannot look at a child and, and see if that child is eligible for membership. You might expect to see certain racial features. You may not see that. You may see difference between the different siblings. Um, there, there's been a lot of, especially the Eastern tribes, a lot of contact for, for a long time. So there has been a lot of uh, mixing uh, between um, different races and Indians. So you cannot look at, it could, I mean, one person may look very much Indian and not be a member of a tribe. The other one may not look like it and absolutely be uh, a part of a federally recognized tribe. So just don't take appearances. So the question is, do you ever do DNA testing to help determine um, tribal membership? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. I don't know of any tribe that's actually got, I think they're working on that. Uh, the problem with, and I think they're moving closer and closer to be able to, to single out a, a particular tribe, but most, for the most part, you might, you might detect Indian markers in that may show 25% or 35% Indian markers, maybe 50, 100, but you can't not necessarily tell if this person was a member of some Cherokee tribe or if they're uh, Choctaw or something like that. It may not, it can't distinguish like that. But they're, they're moving closer on that. Okay, so if you are asking for the, the sites to look for the, it's in the Federal Register, but it's also published on that website. Okay. And that's the information on the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So um, it would tell you how to look. This would set out how you'd look. You'd, you'd look on the register to see if it's registered if the tribe is federally registered, and then you would look for the regional office of the Bureau um, and the contact information to send to the, to the tribe. And that way you'll be able to figure out which two. You send information, if you're looking for it, to the Bureau and to the, um, to the actual tribe. You send it to both, correct? Okay. All right. And uh, back to other ways that, that these are other ways to determine how a tribal membership um, could be determined. And I know the chief has gone over the degrees, um, but chief, do you want to talk, touch on the other other ways? Maybe the tribal card? Well, yeah, so they'll, sometimes they'll have, they may have a uh, certificate of Indian blood uh, that may state that. It's issued by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, not all tribes use that. It, it could be, you could have a tribal membership card with a <coughs> roll number uh, that would indicate they're a member of the tribe. And I guess for... About, uh, there's also mentioned about the health documents. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're, uh, they may have been treated by uh, Indian Health Service. That might have the information on it. So if you're unable to determine Indian status, this is the, the step that you would take. You would contact and ask the tribe as a member. Um, you would determine if the child is living in an Indian community. Um, you would ask... Um, about Indian heritage, um, you would consult with relatives and you would contact social services, health or educational, and then you would contact the BA, BIA. But now here's, I think, the more practical way that it happens. Um, you have a child that either comes into care or you have a child that you're working with and all of a sudden you're told that the child has Indian background. And we all know that that will then trigger the Ch Indian Child Welfare Act and that we will know that certain higher protections under the law will be afforded to that child. But when you begin to ask, well, explain how the child is a member of the tribe, that's when you can't get the answer straightened out. So, Chief, if somebody is not enrolled, if they are enrolled, they should have some documentation to be able to prove it, correct? They should be able to prove it if they're actually enrolled. Okay. And if a parent, now, since, every, since each child or each tribe determines the enrollment process. And I think only, is it only one tribe that automatically enrolls or one state? I think it's one of the, one state will automatically enroll their children. But other than that, it is an active, it's an active, it's an active act, it's not a passive act. Like you have to go and do the paperwork to be, become a member of the tribe, correct? I think most are that way, but not all. Okay. Every tribe's different. You gotta keep that in mind. So if you have, if you have a child whose parents say that they would be eligible and they're 
not, then it's only if the parent would be eligible. Like you don't keep going back. It's the parents have to take the step. But if if because what, what we see, and y'all have to get me wrong, is you'll say, my great grandmother or my grandmother or somebody else's relative are, are are members of or members of a tribe. And you can't find any of that for for that where do you cut it off? Well, it's still possible. So, that nothing that, like asking the presenter questions, but. <laughs> it's still possible for a person to be eligible for membership. It may be they hadn't enrolled, but they, if they uh, are part of a certain family group that, that is, has an unbroken lineage with that tribe, they still might be eligible for membership. So the parents may not be, but they, the child may still be eligible. But it's in, not the usual case, but it could be. But in order for somebody to go, if the parent's not, if the parent's not enrolled, and the parent, the grandparents aren't enrolled, the likelihood that they can form the chain to be federally recognized is? The only way to find out for sure is contact the tribe. OK. All right. OK, go ahead. Okay. All right, so what proceedings does ICWA apply to? They applies to, obviously, to foster care, to termination of parental rights, to pre-adoptive placements, which means, for those of you who do private adoptions, it applies to the superior court world and not just the juvenile court that we that, that we normally work in. Um, voluntary and involuntary placements, divorce proceedings when the parties will not be getting custody. So happens every once in a while, but if a third party would be intervening in a um, superior court divorce case, it would apply there. Um, I don't think we have this in the state of Georgia, but anybody else who practices might tell me, but juvenile delinquency proceedings where parental rights might be terminated. Um, I don't think we have that, that that is a category. So somewhere out there, apparently, you can be bad and lose your parents. Um, status offenses, wait, 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 go back one. Status offenses, which would be our delinquency proceedings, like our unrulies or ungovernables. Um, and that is a, that is one I'm sure we've not focused on in the delinquent side of the house because um, I, I don't know that we, when we do status offenses, ask about Indian heritage. So we'll probably need to check on that one and see. Okay. All right. So, but ICWA does not apply during violations of criminal law and um, divorces. And I guess maybe the theory on that would be status offenses would be ungovernables or runaway or unruly, so maybe that's something where family issues would be involved and you'd more likely to have the social service side of the house come into play. That's, I guess, my I'll take on that one, okay? Question. Yes, ma'am. A couple of years ago, um, we took a group of students over to Alabama to the Porch Creek um, Indian tribe. And we were, they had their own legal system. They had their own justice system within the tribe. And different <laughs> proceedings were hand, you know, um, anything that dealt with um, status offenses or even some criminal offenses were held and dealt with substance abuse cases uh, were all held, held and governed by the tribe itself. So does that tend to work? through most tribes be, well, yeah, that's my question. Does that tend to happen through most tribes? And how does that play out in Georgia? I'm going to let the chief respond to all that, and then I'll, I'll come back on. Porch Band was one of those tribes that was state recognized. It's been federalized. Um, they're actually, we were actually from Georgia, part of the Porch Band at one time uh, in the past. But the, uh, yeah, the porch ban has done real well since they've been federalized, I think, in 85, I believe. Um, they have their own court system, and most tribes have those. Uh, not all tribes do, but most do. Um, they, they work pretty good. In the criminal situation, they've been really limited on what they could do. They made some changes, I think, last year, trying to improve that. Improve that um, but because they were limited to 12 months on sentences. After, uh, above that, they had to go and, and be tried in federal court. Uh, they've made some changes, and I think now they can give, if they opt into the program, I think up to seven years for criminal offense. And um, so, but there's, it's very expensive, and so not all tribes are doing that. Uh, where that comes into play, like the, like the Navajos, they were having a 
tremendous problem with pedophiles and, and not being able to do something about it because they were limited to 12 months in charging these offenders and the federal courts sometimes wouldn't take up the charges so it was real crippling and it was you know just kind of feeding on itself but the, they've tried to make some changes I think I, I don't think they've done enough in that in that area but um, yeah they they've uh, some of these tribes have got very well developed judicial systems but now in Georgia since we have state recognized tribes and not federally recognized tribes do any of the state tribes have any um, agreements like with local courts to allow you to handle things that happen off the reserve or off the air I mean well we work a lot with uh, these child cases and usually uh, work with the usually defects first and not just in Georgia but poor people have moved away into other states and usually what they try to do is try to work with them to rehabilitate they have certain steps that the parents have to mm -hmm. go and they usually try to work it that way to try to keep the parent the the children um, in place uh, if that's not possible then we try to find some other relative or uh, like that and we've got complete records we know we can take any member of the tribe family and know we know all who their aunts and uncles and ever ever even their all their ancestors way on back to 1832 so we've got a lot of information on that I think maybe we're gonna skip out of order like really out of order for a second but you don't need to look at the slide I'll get the slide to okay. you but um, could you tell them basically about the state tribes and who's here and, and which yeah, tribes exist. Yeah, yeah, I can get I can get there while you're starting if you want. All right, don't look at this. <laughs> I'll get a headache. Okay. There we go. That actually yeah, probably might make it, it less confusing if we start with this with the state. Here, use my Okay. Okay. All right, Georgia um, has a knowledge uh, three um, tribes as legitimate Indian tribes in Georgia. Um, the remnant tribes, the, uh, there is one, there's a Cherokee tribe in North Georgia located around the, the Alonica area. Uh, they, um, Georgia passed a law in 1838 or 39 allowing them to stay there. Um, and they, you know, they're still there. There's still, there's, um, I think there's close to 500 of those people there. Uh, there, there is another group uh, along the coast over there, and I don't really know a whole lot about the history. What I've been told is, is there was some Cherokees that came down to fight in the Seminole War. Uh, the first one was fought along that Jacksonville down below there, and uh, they were uh, come down and just sort of stayed, didn't go back. Now the, the Lower Muscogee Creek tribe is is made up of uh, the, the descendants from the original Creek Nation, uh, like Porch, very similar to Porch. Um, Porch is is made up had three historical communities over there. Uh, now they also have a, a fairly large group in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, there's actually some of the Porch Creeks had left, and you know they. They were right there on a the train and they kept trying to find places to work. There's actually a group over around Argyle, Georgia, that associates more with the lower Muscogee Creeks of Georgia than, than Porch, but they came from Porch. Um, the lower Muscogee Creek is made up of uh, uh, about, there's 20, right, 2,700 members, and they're located primarily in uh, Grady, Thomas, uh, Decatur. Uh, Seminole counties in that area. Uh, there is two communities, uh, larger communities, also located in Florida, in the Holmes Valley area in Walton County, Florida, that are interconnected family-wise and also participate in, in the tribal government. Um, the, the reason why they're there is one has been, like my family was married into um, families that had some influence that could protect them. Uh, there's also a, uh, some of them stayed there because there was a, a guy by the name of William Williams uh, who was also mixed blood, but uh, was a big landowner, uh, threatened a contractor that he would arm the local Indians, and so they kind of left him along. The others were known as border hoppers, and that was, uh, and, and there's letters from the governor of Georgia and Florida kind of arguing over whose problem they were. 
because they kept moving back and forth across the Georgia and Florida border there. And um, I, even I've read one dispatch from a U.S. Army officer who, um, who said that basically he was having trouble making contact and only backup, our only help he had was the Georgia militia and he just suggested that we just leave him alone, there's no, no problem. So those are the families that pretty much make up the Lower Muscogee Creek tribe. Now they were part of, um, uh, of the uh, case, uh, the Docket 21, You'll see, that's also mentioned in Georgia law. Um, where that came from, am I going too far? Was oh, no, you're good. Okay. Where that came from uh, was it, it really developed, started in the Red Stick War. Uh, that, was a, that was actually a civil war between uh, the Creek Nation itself. Uh, Red Sticks uh, helped the British. Uh, the White Sticks or Lower Creeks uh, stayed along with the, and actually helped the United States and did not bear arms against the United States. Um, after the conclusion of that war, Andrew Jackson decided that he wanted all this land, went through South Georgia and up into Alabama, and Porch was also part of that. Uh, they fought along, uh, 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 most, I think most of the people actually fought uh, with the United States, or some actually was on the other side. Uh, that's actually, that area is where the Red Stick War started there at uh, Fort Mims. Um, but after the war, Jackson decided he wanted this land. He forced the Friendly Creeks to sign the treaty, uh, giving them that land. And, and somehow after that process, they forgot all about paying for that land that they promised they'd pay for it. And, and the suit started, I think, sometime early part of the 20th century. Oklahoma was uh, initiated the suit. Uh, Calvin McGee, who's from Porch there, uh, joined into the uh, suit. And then Calvin organized the other Creek communities in the East, and they were known at that time as, as collectively as Creek Nation East of Mississippi. And so they were all part of this, the, the, the uh, Court of Claims uh, against the uh, United States trying to get the money paid for the treaty. And that really didn't get completed until the 1980s. And uh, so it went all that during that time. And, and, and that's how they were able to get federal, federally recognized? Well, uh, the question is, is that how they're able to get federally recognized? Part of, see, they, the, the Court of Claims recognized the whole group as Creek Nation East. The, the Bureau, being the way they are, they, they kind of stuck with the conquer and divide, and so they thought uh, 7,000 Creek Indians was too many. And so what they'd done is sliced it up, and Porch was able to attain their federal recognition. It was kind of planned out that way, and, and so they got a nice little neat package rather than having a whole bunch of people to deal with. That's the primary reason why the Lumbees cannot get recognized in, in uh, North Carolina. There's just too many uh, to suit them, and they try to you know, keep it small. That's, you know, that's their ideal. They, they want to keep the, the funding is what they're worried about. All right, so in your packet should um, the chief put together all of the other state recognized tribes. Um, so seven of those Virginia tribes are up for federal recognition right now. They've already passed the uh, House of Representatives. There we go. Yeah. They passed the House of I think there's eight up there, but there's actually seven, I think it's in the, in the law. They passed the House of Representatives. They've got a, a recommended for passed out of one of the Senate committees, but it hadn't been voted on yet, so that may change. All right, and then you talked earlier about it, but then these are just the contact, if you're looking for the Georgia tribe contact information, um, would be right there. And as you can see, okay. All right, so now close your eyes again, because I'm gonna go back. <laughs> Oh, is it time for a break? What time is it? No. What is it? Do we need a break? Does anybody need a break yet? Okay. No. Okay. If not, we'll go. We'll keep going. Because after I go backwards, y'all might need a break. All right. So this is think where we started uh, before we went fast forward. All right. So as we talked about earlier. Um, you know, most, for most of us in here, and I, I guess I didn't ask, but I'm going to make an assumption that most of us in here are involved in the social service. Um, no. How many people are defects workers? Okay. 
How many people are SAGs? How many people are guardian ad litems? How many people are CASAs? How many defense attorneys do we have? Two. Two. How many public or how many district attorneys do we have? Two. How about um, private attorneys who do adoption work? Okay. All right. Okay, then I'm going to rephrase that. For those of us who have to deal with emergency removals, um, the determination of whether the child is an Indian child um, needs to be made um, before the removal. And the, now I say that with knowing that you can't always deal with things in an emergency. It, ideally, you would want to know this before you made the decision. Um, because the standard for removal in an Indian Child Welfare Act case is a greater standard than the standard that we use in Georgia. So you have to make, um, you have to make the determination, this determination, before you can make um, a removal unless it's an emergency removal of these criteria. Immediate safety, eminent physical danger. So it's a lot higher standard than what we remove for um, in, in the state level. So you would need to know, um, obviously, all these in, this information unless it was that emergency. Um, and then if you were placing, the preference for placing, placement um, is outlined in the Act. It's in 1915B which basically says you go down the list, um, except for an emergency, would be a member of the Indian child's extended family, a foster home licensed or approved or sp specified by the Indian ch in child's tribe, an Indian foster home licensed or approved by an authorized non-Indian licensing authority, and an institution for children approved by an Indian tribe or operated by an Indian organization that has a suitable program to meet the child's needs. As far as Emergency placement. Emergency placement has to end as soon as the danger of imminent physical harm has passed or the appropriate jurisdiction assumes the case. So it's a much more restrictive standard as, as we had talked about. Um, the child welfare worker must undertake diligent efforts um, to place the child during the emergency care in the, stand, in the um, preferences that we just talked about um, and that the child's Indian tribe has the right to designate the placement order, and our court would have to follow that designation as long as it's as the least restrictive um, placement for children. When, oh, okay, so she's waving and you've got your hand up. Okay, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question too? Okay. okay. Um, what happens if the standard isn't met, the higher standard isn't met, and you find out the child has Indian heritage after the removal? How far after the removal? Because, because failure to comply. The case I'm thinking of is about two weeks old right now. Okay. I, I, this is the dominant, it, it depends. Because <laughs> I think it goes to the motive and the understanding of knowing when you found out what was going on with the children. Like if the children came in, as a regular removal, and you didn't, they didn't determine the active, that, that active efforts were necessary, it would probably would not apply until you, you found it out. Now, if, if they knew, if the person, if, it was, if the child was readily identifiable as an Indian tri tribal member, then um, the ultimate for anything of violation is the, the act taken by the state is diminished. It can disrupt and dissolve an adoption if you don't follow the law properly. So I would say it could probably result in the child being returned and starting over. But um, I mean, I think in any way, it, it also requires you to use some common sense in how you apply the, the standards. Um, did you have a question, ma'am? Yes. When a child comes into care, um, does the Indian Child Welfare Act indicate that uh, some representative of the tribe should be present at the time of any hearing? It allows for the notice of the, of the representative to be present. 
it does not say that they have to be there, but they are afforded the opportunity to be there if they wish to. But <laughs> we're um, actually going to get to to that in a second. So if you could, can I hold the question till we get through the rest of that? Okay. Um, and then in foster care placements, the preference of the uh, child or parent is to be considered. Um, and the court has to protect the anonymity of the, of the request, but um, will, must give weight to their, to their uh, preference. So what is active efforts? Um, active efforts is not defined in ICWA, um, but it refers to an effort more intense than um, reasonable efforts. And it applies to the remedial and rehabilitation services to the family prior to the removal and um, after the removal. So um, there is an intensive effort to prevent the removal, removal in the first place on the front end and on the back end. Active efforts applies through the whole, through the whole proceedings. Um, the federal register, the federal guidelines um, is where that, that short definition comes from. Now, there are, there are other materials that would give you an, a, a good idea that the National Council of Juvenile Court Judges has worked with a number of tribes and states to come up with um, some guidance. And this is a very good document, um, the Revised Active Efforts Principles and Ex Expectations for Oregon, which is available um, online in its entirety. And it is what the state of Oregon came up for and the expectations for the child welfare workers at, to, to, um, to follow through. So it's, it's kind of a, a good guide to look at. But what they have talked about is uh, obviously the document itself was a commitment to the requirements and the spirit of the act. And the recommendations are that you make early contact and active engagement of the child's tribe. Um, and really that will do one of two things. It will make sure that um, the tribe and you have a, um, an, an experience from the beginning that is open and honest um, so that we have good collaboration between the two. And it will also, um, as case managers, it will also make your job a lot easier because um, you are going to have to do your diligent search. You're going to be looking for relatives. Um, if you make contact with the tribe the way that you're supposed to, you're going to um, know the resources that you're looking for. And based on my prior discussions with Chief McCormick, um, I would think that you will actually have a much easier time um, finding a relative placement for the child than you would with a, a regular um, dominant culture case. And the reason for that is just like he said earlier, that they have all the records on the families, they know everybody, and they will probably be a case manager's uh, best friend in finding placements. Yes, ma'am. Okay, point of clarification. So if, if the Child Welfare Act is really uh, uh, applicable to those tribes that are federally recognized, and Georgia does not have any federally recognized tribes. We have state recognized tribes. So will, does this policy therefore has to be, a, is it applicable to what happens in the state of Georgia? Okay, let me answer that in no. It is, it is not required by law that you do that but it would be our recommendation that you should because okay. the only distinction between a state recognized Indian tribe, child tribe and the, the federal is the, is the distinction of the, the political distinction. I mean, all of the things, they still have their culture. They right. still, so right. from a case manager perspective, if you know that this child belongs to a state tribe, you should, should do the same, you should do the same the thing. Steps. I mean, you're okay. going to be doing it. Okay. You're going to be doing it anyway. anyway. But okay. um, but there's no requirement in Georgia law that you have to take active efforts with a state recognized child. But now, Chief, since you are the chair, tell them how many Native Americans who are federally recognized or are members of 
other tribes are currently in Georgia? Well, so a lot of the members of these state tribes may be eligible for membership uh, in one of the federal tribes. Uh, there's about, uh, there's, I'm not forgot exactly how many. There's, there's a lot in North Georgia that are a member of the state tribe, but are also a member of the Oklahoma Cherokees. So you got you got to be careful there. Uh, you you also uh, there's a lot of intermarrying, and you, they may actually be the children may be uh, eligible for membership in one of these tribes too. And but, um, but how many Native Americans are residing in Georgia about right 70, now? About seventy thousand. Right. Sir? Yeah, I want to go back to your uh, what are active efforts and your the goals. Okay. And it states that the active effort is more intense mm -hmm. before and after removal. And the goal also states that it's vigorous and a high level of effort than typically constitutes reasonable efforts. Is that just assuming that the, what we do on a normal or everyday basis is mediocre? No. The difference is active or passive. On a regular daily basis, you could say to a woman who came in, uh, you need to make an appointment with a, to schedule a substance abuse assessment. For, a, for an, an ICWA case, you would need to make sure you actively scheduled that with her. Like, you can't, you cannot, you have to, you have to be actively engaged in making sure the services are, are put in place. Well, and, and, I, and you may do that. Your, I mean, you may do that. You may do that for all of your cases instead of saying, you yes. know, it's your responsibility to find this thing. No, under active efforts, it's your responsibility to find it and link your the, the person with it. Does that make sense? No, no, it doesn't. It well, you can't just say, hey, here's a list of, of providers. Go ahead and make a call. You have to say, hey, here's the person that we need. Sit down here, and we're going to get this set up for you. Like, you, but, can't, you can't leave it just to them. But, you may do that already, and you may be doing active efforts in all your cases, and that would be great. But that's what I thought that was required anyway was an active effort. Not only do you list, but you also help to engage, and you then check back and make sure that the engagement has been made or why it has not been made. Yeah, under the ICWA Act, you don't have time to figure that out. Under the ICWA Act, you need to say, if this is what it is, it needs to get done. Like, there's no, like, let's see if she can do it herself or let's do it. It's like, this is what needs to be done, so you will actively help them effectuate what you want done. That's not an issue. I'm sorry? That's different from what is in the Child Welfare Reform Act itself? As far as? In terms of use of the word active. Yeah, I, like I said earlier, that's how they define active. But the way that if you look at the other materials when we go either through active efforts, probably say it, but it says it goes beyond referring um, and help. Referring for services, you have to help them engage the services themselves. Well, I'm just saying, in questioning reasonable efforts, it, I thought that that would be a question, especially if the parent or the person that we are trying to help engage, let's say in a case plan, mm -hmm. okay, if it's determined that they need more than just a referral, there is a question as what efforts have you done in helping them get to the referral? Yes. Or otherwise, there are no reasonable efforts here. Okay, right. I, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to. Oh, no, I, I mean, I think that's why it says it's not been really well defined, and that's why Oregon put together the handbook for, for their case managers to, to do it. But, the, you know, if you're saying the, the person purports to look like they can dial a phone and they have phone access and they don't have any impairments that wouldn't, you know, other than that they would lose their mind trying to make a call to one of these places and being put on hold, like, that aside, if they are capable of doing all that and you say, give, you know, here's the number and, and then they don't do it, well, if you come in front of me and you say, well, judge, you know, I gave them the number, they didn't, you know, they had a phone, they didn't tell me they didn't know how to dial the phone, you know, they didn't have any problems, they, but they didn't make the appointment. Well, you made your reasonable efforts because you gave them all the information. They didn't ask for your assistance. You didn't expect them to need assistance. They just chose not to do that. And But you would question and make sure that they just chose not to do that when you ask it, do they have any disability or any handicap? Right. 
if, but they, it, but in, do or not, if they do or not have transportation, mm -hmm. uh, if they need uh, some type of therapy because they don't have muscular coordination or exactly. something. Exactly. All, all the reasons why you, you know, wouldn't, all right. you know, the, the dog ate the, the card with the number on it. But the act does not allow for that. The act says you have to be active. So if you came in front of me with an Indian child, I would say, did you assist her in making the appointment? No, I just gave her a number. That's not active efforts the way it's being defined. Like, you need to make sure if you want them to do something that you are actively helping them complete the task that you think is needed. So if I came before you with just a uh, child that's not Indian, then you would just ask me, well, did you give them a number? And that would be the end of it. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know because it depends on how the person looked there. I mean, you know how it is. I mean, reasonable is reasonable. Like, if the child, if the person came in and, and you know, they, they, um, didn't have a phone and you know they were impaired and you gave them a number and or you gave them and you didn't that I'd say probably that wasn't really reasonable but in this particular case the doubt is kind of gone because you are you are expected to actively help these people get the services that they need when they come to you and I guess I'm having problems because I don't understand why that expectation just applies to Indians okay. what is it about <laughs> Indians that you have you know, I mean, that is an expectation that should apply to everyone. It should apply to Hispanics when you talk, take into their cultural consideration. It should apply to Rastafarians. You know, what is it that, why is there this act just for the Indians when there are other cultural subgroups within the United States, you know, that have their own customs, their own ways, and, and they're not given that consideration? Chief? I would agree. With, uh, I would agree that they should be treated. All, that all children should be. Uh, that active effort should be done. What What's unique about this is a particular relationship between American Indians and and the federal government, because the federal government has got a obligation. Um, so the way treaties work originally. It's not that the, the federal government has given the tribes certain rights. Those tribes gave the federal government rights. Um, the, the tribes are older than the federal government. And there's a unique, uh, the, 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 the United States has taken on a unique responsibility of those tribes. And the tribes are basically being dismantled uh, because of this high rate of adoption and removing the Indian children. And so they, they, Congress acted to protect those, those tribes is what they did. Now, it doesn't mean that the other shouldn't, shouldn't be handled, but, the, but this act particularly dealt with the Indian tribes. And I guess to, to follow on that, I mean, I think that, like, really, when you're talking about the Indian tribes, you're actually talking about two sovereignties. You're talking about two different countries dealing with each other, okay? And I, I too, agree that all we should do active efforts on, on all children. But then I think human rights. Right. Yeah. But then I think that gets back to social service policy and what our other requirements are. I mean, our best social workers make active efforts even though we don't, you know, we don't call it that. I mean, but I think then sometimes when you're looking at reasonable efforts, if you're trying to determine if a parent is able to t make basic or do things for themselves, I understand what what he's saying is you need to give them the opportunity to show that they are capable or want to make the efforts to reunify with their children. And I'm saying that with as long as there's no other impairments that would make you say, how could you expect a person to do that with X, Y, or Z? Um, yes, I, I agree. We should, in the perfect world, I would have an expectation that everybody has active efforts with a child. Yes, ma'am. So I understand what is going on in Georgia. The, would, would your advice be for the defects workers in the room to go practice at that higher standard? And in so doing, even if it's only a state recognized tribe child? Because, and in so doing, will they run afoul of any other law about you know, any sort of discrimination that they provided additional services and, and the Hispanic kid next door isn't getting that? Well, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, well, right. While you're thinking that, I would say I would say that you have state recognized tribes that have um, all of the all of the things that the federally recognized tribes were done for still apply to the state tribes. 
in our chick tribe still have federal roll numbers. Still have what? Federal roll numbers from oh, Docket oh. 21. So but I think these are in you know these are Indian governments, and so I mean I don't see where you file any the recognized and knowledge. I don't see where you'd be filing any sort of uh, discrimination there. But of course, all children should be uh, uh, cared for. But I think the question there is is looking at making sure the tribal identity doesn't get erased. That's that's the difference in there. But I, I mean, I think what when you go African American identity or Mexican identity, they should be protected. Too. They should be protected as well. But I think what you're talking about, even on your time frames, you've got if you're using a safety plan, your safety plan lasts what? Not supposed to last more than 45 days before you seek another permanency plan. If you're using a, a family protective service plan, you're not supposed to exceed 90 days without getting a permanency. So if you know that there's a state tribe child, it would be to your benefit and also to meet your diligent search. I mean, it would seem to me that if you were working with an Indian child from a state tribe, you would have to do less work to meet reasonable efforts if you contacted the tribe quicker than if you, than you didn't because they should be able to provide you with the relatives, the services, all the other things that they can provide. Um, and as far as the tribes, our tribes are not only rec not recognized for justice money. The, the tribe in, the, your tribe runs a voc rehab program, correct? So, you know, they are, they are functioning in a tribal, they have federal recognition for the voc rehab money, and it's not just for, for Indian. Uh, and also the Indian trade law um, crafts, you have to be either a member of a federal or state recognized tribe in order to do something and say it's Indian made. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's kind of a, uh, Indian law, they, one judge that was schizophrenic is kind of all over the place. And it's because of the long history of, of bias and other things that's come into play over the years. Uh, the United Nations has also done some recommendations on indigenous, uh, indigenous people, and um, the Supreme Court has even alluded to that, the United States Supreme Court. So um, you've got, you got a lot of Hispanics that are part of Indian tribes that are coming from South America. And so you, got, you, know, you may need to consider their issues too so that, you know, that they don't lose identity of who they are. Is it time to take a break now? I think it's okay, let's take a break. <laughs> when are we supposed to be back? Uh, why don't we give it 10 minutes? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so we're going to get back here. I feel like um, we're stepping back into the active efforts part, but that's like the next place of the thing, so we're there. And I did share with uh, the gentleman the active efforts pamphlet. So um, if you could maybe hold that up, see it's like that, and you can, you can get a copy of that, and uh, that will give you some good pointers on what active efforts means. So if we are coming into the juvenile court and you're filing a petition, um, again, it, I know this is kind of contrary to how we think about children coming in on a petition. But again, it has to be a, cir a circumstance where the child would suffer immediate physical harm, and your active efforts would have to be documented um, the same way. You need a written plan of action describing the active reunification efforts that had been undertaken and the plans to restore the child to um, his parent. Right. And then the petition, okay, see. All right, and then the petition, again, should have the name, the age, the last known of the child, the name and address of the child's parents, the Indian custodian, and the tribe. Um, and if the name, location, or of the child's parents, custodian, or the tribe is unknown, then the, you should document the efforts to ascertain the information. As I said earlier, the petition has to allege um, the child would suffer imminent physical danger. Um, and at the break, somebody said, well, what if the imminent danger was that um, the person was drunk and you couldn't find somebody to care for the child? Well, when the child was not, when the person was not drunk anymore, the child would have to be returned. 
Um, okay. Okay. So here, I guess here is the, um, the, the difference for us. As far as reservations, Chief, what's the closest federal reservation? Uh, Porch, Alabama. So Alabama. So um, I guess uh, unless a child from Alabama, I mean, for the most part, this is going to be the not normal way that we, we deal with children, I guess, unless you're on that the border where a child could come across. Well, not necessarily because they're, they're from all over the United States. Okay. So I stand corrected. If you have a child that, that is in Georgia, but this is for children who are um, domiciled on the reservation or temporarily off. So I guess if somebody... I guess if a child who is normally on a reservation is visiting Atlanta or comes here, but as far as um, for a child who ultimately resides on a reservation, you have to develop the plan on how to return the child to the, de to the reservation. Or the uh, places where it was formerly the reservation, like in Oklahoma, uh, they eliminated all the reservations except the Osage, but they've, they've got tribal districts out there that was historically their reservation at one time. If they resigning on or near that, it could, it could be the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it, okay, and so this is a question. But ICWA does not apply to tribes because ICWA um, gives the tribes right and opportunities. Um, and you asked about the representative earlier, so the question would be: Are tribes required to intervene in ICWA cases? And the answer is no. They can exercise their right to intervene, but they're not required to do so. And there's a difference between intervention and transfer. They could intervene and ask for certain things, or they could ask for the case to be transferred. So they're two different things. Now, I think this is going to apply um, more to your adoption cases than to your, um, the cases that come through the juvenile court. But the question is, does ICWA apply even if a parent does not want it to apply? And the answer is yes. So. Um, again, back to the intervention and transfer, the parent can object to the transfer of the case with good cause, and then the court, the state court, um, can determine whether the deviation from the placement preferences would be, uh, would have good cause. Um, so we'd already talked about when it applies. We're going to go back to, it goes back to before the child is removed. And again, we're going to talk about the active efforts. Um, and the court should ask you to demonstrate that active efforts had been made and were proven unsuccessful. One of the things that you need in an ICWA case that um, you don't normally need, well, depends on our court of appeals. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But uh, who is an expert witness in relation to ICWA? Because you need an expert witness in the case. Um, a qualified expert witness as defined by the statute is not, def of course, it's not defined uh, in the ICWA Act, um, but the House report uh, states that it is meant to apply to expertise beyond normal social worker qualifications. The Federal Register in 1979 says that this is, this is who an expert is for ICWA, a member of the child's tribe who is recognized by the tribal community as knowledgeable in tribal customs as they pertain to family organization and child rearing practices, or a lay person having substantial deli delivery of child and family services to Indians and extensive knowledge of prevailing social and cultural standards and child rearing practices within the child's tribe, or a professional person having substantial education in his or her area of specialty along with substantial knowledge of prevailing social and cultural standards and child rearing practices within the Indian community. So, Obviously, when you're looking at who the expert is, we're not looking at um, we're not looking at a expert in child development or child psychology. We're looking at an expert in in Indian child rearing practices. And so, Chief, to put you on the stand on that, um, what is your the the council's role in assisting with that? Have, are you contacted with those questions? We can, what we can do is try to make contact with, uh, you know, the tribes and try to find someone that would fit that. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is um, from the, the checklist that's referen referenced in the back. Um, so if you're going to remove a child, 
that you proof by um, that the child, the tribe is notified to intervene, that you have um, proof by clear and convincing evidence by a qualified expert that the child will suffer emotional or physical harm if returned home, proof that DFACS has made active efforts to prevent the placement, preference placement made to the extended family <coughs> members and approved tribe, and then an Indian foster home or Indian approved institution. Now, this is one where I've actually had this happen a few times it, when I was practicing and, and now, um, approving the voluntary placement of an Indian child. So a surrender executed by a, a person of Native American descent does not ripen. You cannot take in the defects office a surrender on a child like you do um, and then have it in 10 days be good. The um, consent has to be signed more than 10 days after the child's birth. Um, and when the certify in there means the judge, you have to, um, I have to certify, or whoever, whichever judicial officer you're appearing in front of, has to certify that I explained the terms and consequences and the parents understood. I have to certify that if the explanation was in language, it was in English language, or if it had to be translated into another language that the parent understood, then I have to follow the preference uh, to placement. And as I said earlier, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't ripen. So the, the surrender, um, even if you, if you take it, um, it will be good until the adoption is finalized. Um, the terminating parental rights, again, you have to notify the tribe of their right to intervene. Um, you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt by the qualified expert that the child will suffer emotional, physical harm or return home, your proof of active efforts and your placement. Here's, the, uh, here's again the consent, which just indicates at the bottom that um, it is, can be withdrawn for any reason at any time before the entry of a final order of termination or adoption. Here's how you give notice and the time frames. You send the notice to the parent, the Indian custodian, the child's tribe by registered mail, return receipt requested of the proceeding and the right to intervene. <coughs> if you can't find the identity or location of the parent, you give the notice to the secretary, which is the secretary of the, the, interior. Of the interior, who has 15 days to notify the tribes. You cannot have a hearing uh, any sooner than 10 days, and the tribes have a right to request a 20-day continuance. Um, which standard applies? The standard, either the federal law or the state law that applies a higher standard to the protections of the parent or the custodian uh, is the one that applies. So. Got a question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Ms. I do have a question. From my days in practice, I had a couple of cases where I would have to notify a tribe. And on occasion, the tribe would not respond. And so it would just go into sort of a pattern of silence. At what point, a couple of questions about that. What's a reasonable thing to do at that point? How persistent do you need to be to get the attention of the tribe? And when should you feel safe proceeding with a court proceeding in the absence of response from the tribe? Okay, I'm going to defer the first part of the question to the, to the chief, then I'll swing back to that. Did, did you send a certified mail? And yes. what is there a particular department in the tribe that you sent it to? The you may see there's a chief's office. It may be the uh, they may actually have a family and children services themselves. It, it may have to go to funnel to the right department. To the extent that I remember, it was directed to sort of the if you will the administrative hierarchy of the tribe. It wasn't to a social services arm. It was to the tribal representatives. You may want to send it twice. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which was gonna which was going to be my response as well. I, the times that I have worked with the tribes, it, it was a little slow to get the response back. Um, so I would say twice. Um, because I would rather be a little slower on the front end than have it all come apart on the back end. Um, so, And again, this kind of goes back to what if a child is Indian, but not a member of a federally recognized tribe? And I think that kind of takes us back to our talk a second ago. Um, if, 
if you can't meet those criteria, either under 18, unmarried, and a member of the tribe, or could be a member of the tribe, then you are not an Indian as defined by federal law. But you're an Indian no, only by, only by this. this. <laughs> Again, schizophrenia. So all other, for us here, then all other state laws applying the relative provisions and the opportunity to be heard in case reviews would apply. But again, from a practice point, I would go back to say that if you access the, fam the state tribes here, they're going to make your compliance with all of the state laws much more easier than I think if you were just looking for relatives uh, all around the country. So now, what were you going to say, Chief? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I think it was it. Okay. All right. So, all right. Now, we did this a second ago, so um, I just wanted to get back to the council because this is a resource that I'm not sure um, that most of us know existed. And um, my work with the Committee for Justice for Children was to uh, reach out to our tribal members and see if, if we were in compliance, if they knew about us, how we were doing. And so obviously I, I reached out, and he's right here. Um, but so in 2002, the, the council was awarded the responsibility of advising state and local governments on issues related to Georgia's American Indians. And um, they do meet uh, every second Wednesday of the month in Atlanta. Yeah, there originally was a Commission of Indian Affairs, and then that was powers were transferred to the Office of Indian Heritage and Secretary of State's Office in 1980, I think. And then now those powers have been transferred over to council, so they combined everything. And so um, Lisa Laracy and I went um, last meeting from um, DFACS to begin our initial discussions of how we can communicate better and how the department um, and the courts and the tribes in the state can begin to communicate. So I'm happy to make that announcement. But Chief, you also have other just judges or people who come to you for advice, or how does that work? Yeah, we, well, we get calls from different uh, agencies and uh, uh, cities and counties requesting help in particular areas that may be, may, some area may affect Indians in some way. So we're the, actually the, the only agency now to handle Indian affairs in Georgia. All right. And I know we kind of rushed through it a second ago, but as far as the, um, the tribes, this is the contact information for the tribes in Georgia. And um, there's one of them. Yeah. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, we're we're going to get there. But because I do know one of the practice concerns is how do you reach somebody? And so these are the. Um, the tribes, their addresses, and their eligibility requirements. So, and contact information. And let me see. So, um, Chief, this is this is your tribe. What? Right. Well, so, the, you want to explain I think the, the contact? I think is on another slide. Yes, there we go. Because we have, you have 2,700 members, and the contact. Where did the? Happened to my other one. Okay. All right. We got one more. I will send you that slide. I don't know where they went. So as we were talking earlier, this is your comment about the docket. Uh, docket 21. There was some docket 272. And some. That's what I explained a little bit earlier. So. So. So you have a, and I guess this is where it gets confusing for even me. You're a state recognized tribe, but you still have a federal docket number. So does that mean that, what does that mean? Are you a federal tribe for this act or are you a state tribe for this well, act? Well, it means that we have uh, treaty uh, rights, rights according to our treaties that we had with the United States. So that's, that's restored. Okay. But for this act, you would be a, you would be a, you would be a state tribe. State tribe. Okay. Unless we had a court rule different. Okay, there it is. The Cherokee. That's the one in St. George. Okay. All right. So as far as resources, um, there are a, a number of resources that can direct you in your, in your work. Um, the National Council of Juvenile Court Family Judges um, passed, a revolu res passed a revolution. Passed a resolution. Um, to encourage the greater collaboration between state courts and tribal courts to protect Native American children, and that is on the, the website. Um, and I know there's been some 
concerns that tribal courts are not funded in the way that, that other courts are. In fact, up until, and I don't know if the law has changed yet, but tribal courts didn't receive funding. So the National Council of Family and Juvenile Court Judges also passed a resolution to, in support of tribal courts and the policy recommendations and access to, for the tribal courts to have access to our court improvement fund money. So up in, they, they did not have the ability to have um, court improvement money, which is help improve their, the deprivation side. Um, the courts catalyzing change, the model courts national agenda implementation has a component um, in engagement. So this is what our, is recommended that we do in order for national engagement and components. The components are laid out. Again, I think this goes back to the question of do you apply active efforts to all Indians, whether they have Native Americans, whether they have federal tribal protection or not. And I would say that as far as making sure that we, the appropriate engagement and transformation from the bench and practice, um, I would say, and I would advocate, and I am advocating that those principles belong in our, in our state as well. Um, so that is also available on a bench card for judges in trying to make their decisions, but it's also a good tool for you to have because it also breaks it down. Um, these are the other publications. Now, the gentleman has my active efforts book. Let me see that one. <laughs> You'll have to give it back, I just want you to see. <laughs> so, um, did you have the opportunity to peruse it while you were here? Did it explain active efforts a little bit better or does it still get you to the same concerns? No, it explains a little bit better. Okay, all right, well see then the book is gonna do better than I did. So, <laughs> this is again um, available. I can put it up here for you to copy it down, but you can also, get it online, um, it's posted on the National Council for Juvenile Court Judges um, website as well. And then there are um, the checklist, the Indian Welfare Checklist, which was part of the checklist that you saw that can be used. And then, um, so how does it apply in Georgia and why should we can be concerned about it even if we don't have federal tribes? Well, the State Court Improvement Project, which is Part of the, was established, um, and I know you guys all might know about it, but sometimes we went hard to kind of revisit it. But the was established in 1993 to enable state courts to perform assessments of their foster care adoption law and procedures and to draft the, um, the state plans for statewide reform. And so this goal was to enable courts to fulfill the oversight role required under the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act. So um, here, um, our, our court improvement project is the Committee on Justice for Children. We just don't call it the state. Am I saying that right, Chris? Okay, so, so we have that. Um, and one of the things in the recommendations of the commission was to, um, for the programs, was for the recipient courts to conduct ongoing and meaningful collaboration with child welfare agencies and tribes. And the distinction here was that it applied to all tribes. It did not apply to just federally recognized tribes. So we are a state that has a court improvement project, so therefore even uh, though our, our tribes are not federally recognized, uh, we are to collaborate with them, which is hopefully we're starting to collaborate. And um, there was an emphasis on the data and claim, collection and training for stakeholders. So. For Georgia to be in compliance, um, you have to show, um, we have to show compliance with the five major components of the Indian Child Welfare Act. The identification of Indian children by state welfare agencies, the notification of Indian parents and tribes of state proceedings involving Indian children and their rights to intervene, the placement preferences that we discussed earlier, the active efforts, and the tribal right to intervene in state proceedings or transfer the proceeding to the jurisdiction of the tribe. Um, to see if we are in compliance in Georgia, uh, you have to review Georgia's compliance with the annual progress and service report and the child, service, child and family service plan 
and the Chafee Foster Care Independent Program because those are the three places where the Indian Child Welfare Act bumps up into Georgia child welfare applications. So um, that was my quote on Sitting Bull, which means that I have come to the end of my slide presentation. So um, what I will tell you is all of those three acts require that we are um, collaborating and in a meaningful fashion with our tribes. So, Chief? And we're open for questions. Yes, we are open for questions. Unless you already asked them all. <laughs> yes? Is any of this information included in training for DFAX foster care workers? There, there is information in the training. I think I've seen two components for it. Um, but my suggestion would be that it needs not to be in, just in the foster care piece. It needs to be in, CPS. in the CPS. And so I, I believe those are things that are being worked on to get them into both of the trainings. Because obviously it needs to be in the, the back part, the front part as, as well. So, and apparently it needs to be in status offenses for, for delinquency, which I will have to go check on. Um, Anyone else? Oh, yes, ma'am. If a parent, if a parent alleges um, Indian heritage in a child, mm -hmm. um, we send the correspondence to the tribes to check on eligibility. How should they proceed? Uh, how should uh, DFAC's case manager proceed in the meantime, as far as if they see imminent harm as a risk to the child? Does that make sense? Like, at what, at what point does that definition vest of an yeah. Indian child? Okay, I, I think if you were put on, that you were given notice or knowledge that, it, that, that the child was of possible Native American heritage, um, I think I would proceed on active efforts until proven otherwise. Because you can always stop doing the active efforts and go back to reasonable efforts. But if you've known and you were doing, that to me would be my preference. But Even if it's returning the child, they otherwise would not? Oh, no, see, on that, I think I would, like, Go ahead, Chief. Is she talking about some uh, child that's endangered? Is that, is that what you're referring to? Right. Just at the onset of the case. There's provisions in there. Right. I, I, but I think, Chief, here's here's the here's the where it gets concerned, con, confusing in practice. If you're alleging that you're a member of a of a tribe, I would think that now that you know all the different ways the tribal membership could be proven, I think I would say. Okay, well, what what documentary evidence do you have prior, other than us just signing, sending it out, you know? Can, and that that would be the thing that I would 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 ask from the bench now that I know these things. Like, do you have a tribal card? Do your children have letters? Do you like, per, you know, ask for the practical things to say. Well, okay, you say that, but now where's your roll card? Where's where's the documentation that would easily identify you? Um, and you should be they should be able to prove that if. Yeah, you, you're going to have people to make that claim because they may or may have not heard their great-grandmother was some princess somewhere. And they'll throw that up. And we have that all the time where they'll allege there's some Indian burials where they want us to protect a particular piece of plant, uh, land. It's just basically they're just trying to use us to, to get their own effort. And that, they, you'll have that, so you'll have to work your way through that. I don't think if you've got an emergency situation, you've got to handle that emergency, and there's provisions in the act of that. You can't let that stand your way. You certainly don't want a child harmed. But I think you're asking kind of in that in-between question of there might have been an, an immediate harm. Now the harm is maybe not so harmful, but under a normal circumstance, you might not return the child right away. Yeah. Um, I think you'd have to just play that by, by ear. It could become pretty obvious pretty soon. It, yeah. but, I, but I would think I would ask for the, the documentation that would indicate how they're affiliated with a tribe. And I would think if they wanted their child to be returned to them or to their relative, then those documents should come forth rather quickly. Um, yes, ma'am. I have a question that relates mainly to private placements where we have um, parents signing surrenders and identifying that maybe a child has Indian heritage, but they don't <coughs> know Exactly there. I mean, there's a lot of talk about contacting the tribe. What do you do if you have no idea who the tribe is? Does ICWA, 
impose a burden on you, like as, as an adoption attorney, if I'm taking a surrender and birth mom says, birth dad who's AWOL, I, don't, I mean, I don't have any contact with his family, I don't know where they are, but I'm pretty sure he told me that he had a grandma who was full-blooded something or another, and, um, and that's in her affidavit, I mean, are we obligated under ICWA to write to every federally registered tribe and say, is this child eligible to be a member of your tribe? Are they on the roll Letter for your the, tribe? The Secretary of Interior you should cover that in the, the okay. procedure. So it, it, but I guess you're, you're saying, like, you don't even know. I have no idea what the tribe is. It comes up all the time. Do you have the father's name? Um, so yeah, I mean, we, oh, we well, have parents' yeah. names, yeah. So sometimes we don't have parents' names, so. Um, but, <laughs> But I guess to follow the chief, yeah, I mean, I don't think you, your burden is not to write to every, every place, and I think that... I think the burden's on the person making the claim, too, isn't it? That you well, have to I, I, I guess I don't know that it's a burden, because that person may or may not care whether the ICWA Act applies or not. It, it's more like, are we, are they in compliance well, by... Well, and they're not usually given, I mean, the, the, often it's not explained in detail why you're asking for the information, right. but they do oh, sign, they do have to, in Georgia, have to sign an affidavit that says, I am or am not of Indian heritage, the birth father is or is not, and... And most of the time, even if they say yes, they're like, but nobody's a registered member of the tribe. We don't and, and even I, know what the tribe is. And, and I might advocate that maybe, like, we change our form a little bit to say, you know, are you a member of a federally recognized tribe? Like, you know, not have that question, but then underline have some place where they could think about it a little more. But again, that goes kind of back to the, the thing that if, if that family line has not been kept to where you could go back, they could be of Native American descent, but not fall under the protections at all. And I think we've had that discussion recently where maybe a great grandmother might have been somebody, but no one could prove anything forward, and so that child didn't apply. But I think your, pra your best practice would be to write to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to see if a child could be identified, okay. and then... That's what I thought. Just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anything else that you want to say? Is it okay that we finish a little early? Of course it is. Everyone's glad to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, we've got some cards if anybody. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. I've got some cards here if anybody wants my card. Yeah, and I have them as well. And, and I'll be glad to send the, um, the PDFs of the other documents that I have you want those to be able to be available. Yes, and we can circulate those to anyone who's registered. If you've left your email address and, and want those, we can get those out to you. Thank you very much. So please join me in thanking our speakers again. Thank you.